Okay, um, well thank you Nicole. Um, it's nice to be here, always good to talk about ringtail possums, uh, or even, even better to come down to Bustleton as well, beautiful spot, especially this evening. Um, so yeah, my name's Jeff Barrett, I'm the Regional Ecologist with the, the Deep Department of Parks and Wildlife in the Swan region. And um, I've been in the role for about 11 years now. Uh, my main training or my main expertise is ornithology, so I'm a, I'm a birdo. Uh, most of my work's on black cockatoos and small woodland birds. Um, however, I did, uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions about black cockies tonight, um, if, you, if you have any. Um, however, I did get interested in ringtail possums. Um, there is um, a sm small population of them in the Swan region, uh, around the Lake Clifton area, and, but we didn't know much about them. We were monitoring them, the department was monitoring them every year with spotlight surveys in Yalgrup National Park. So we have uh, 16 transects in that national park. We drive along with a couple of spotlights sticking out the side of the car. Uh, we measure the if we see a possum, we measure the distance to the possum, and it's a, it's, it's a strip transect. So you measure the distance to the possum, count the number of possums, and you, work, you can work out a density. So it's a distance sampling method. And we, um, we noticed uh, in 2016 the number of ringtail possums in Yalgrup National Park, which is, which is a stronghold for ringtail possums in that um, Mandura, um, Southern Swan. There's a must be a ringtail possum out there. Um, and it, it, the National Park is a stronghold for the possums there. And to our um, surprise and, and concern in the local community, the number of ringtail possums we were seeing in the spotlights was dropped right away. Significantly fell away in 2016. So we thought, well, what's going on here? Um, um, and no one really knew. Of course, accusations were flying in all directions, and 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 I and I think the, the that's all right. Uh, and so we thought. Um, so we didn't know what was happening. Uh, accusations were flying everywhere, and I, and and the Parks and Wildlife were sort of um, got a lot of uh, heat from the community because it was decided it was probably fire management. Um, so that's an issue. I can talk a little bit more about that. But nevertheless. And we kept surveying and the numbers of ringtail possums started to increase again and so it's gradually tracking backwards, back up, um, not back to what it was in 2015. But anecdotally what was happening was that um, the locals reported that ringtail possums were still quite common in the suburban areas around Yalgrub National Park. So what was happening was um, the ringtail possums were recolonizing the national park from the surrounding urban areas. So I thought, well, that's very interesting. Um, and I quite like that story because um, um, I've always been interested in uh, conservation biology. And in the 1950s, 1960s, island biogeography was the big uh, theory of the time and it captivated my imagination and, and, all, and all the ecology students. And, and the idea is that um, um, to preserve biodiversity to preserve our native species you just need to have a good network of national parks a comprehensive adequate and representative network of national parks so comprehensive in that you've got all the different kinds of habitats vegetation types um, adequate each one is big enough and, and can can carry the animals and representative there's a good list of species in each one um, and it was a uh, sort of um, tremendous faith in science and, and uh, as long as we do that it'll all take care of itself however by the 19, late 70s um, and well in, into the 80s, people realised that, well, a comprehensive adequate reserve system wasn't working. And it was uh, for reasons like this little story with the ringtail possums. Um, there's always been a very strong flow between national parks and the areas surrounding national parks. And, and it were, was only because the ringtails were surviving in the matrix around Yalgrap National Park that they could re reinvade the, or recolonise the, um, the national park. So um, we thought, well, we can't just focus on national parks. We've got to find out what the ringtail possums are doing in the peri-urban area or in the urban areas. And so we, we got our district staff out there with their spotlights and their vehicles driving around the streets. And that was extremely unpopular because people were wondering what the hell these strangers are doing shining their spotlights into our, into our gardens. Um, so we didn't get very far with that. We've got about two surveys done. And, um, 
And then, and, and so it was about that time in 2016 when I was giving a talk about Quenda, um, um, the little bandicoot, and they do very well in Bustleton. And I was talking about them down here. And then afterwards, Bree Brown from Geocatch came up and said, um, I wonder if we can do something similar for Western Pringtail Possum. And I thought, you know, perfect. You know, here's a, here's a, a group um, that can organize citizen scientists. <laughs> we can model the survey on the Quenda survey, which is quite similar to what you guys are doing for the ringtail possum. And so Geocatch picked it up as uh, the Western ringtail possum tally. And since then we've done five annual um, uh, autumn surveys uh, plus two spring surveys, so seven altogether as um, Nicole said. And you know, spring surveys versus um, autumn surveys, it's a bit like the little Indians and the big Indians in Gull Gulliver's Travels or you know, whether you're a Beatles fan or a Rolling Stones fan, you know. But at the end of the day, if you look at the results, both, both are probably just as effective as the others, uh, whether you do your surveys in spring or you do them in, in autumn. But five of our, all of our surveys have been done, in, every year our surveys have been done in autumn because, that, autumn because that's what the scientists suggested in, in our department. Uh, but spring surveys is also um, okay. So we got the... Um, so yeah, um, and as Nicole said, it's it's taken off. So we've now got um, we've now got surveys being done. Margaret River just this year. We've got Albany. Looks like they're going to take it up. We've got uh, Leshenaltia, and also surveys up around uh, in the Swan region around the Lake Clifton area, Yalgrub National Park area. So I saw the show of hands. Yeah, a lot of you are obviously familiar with Western ringtail possums, but um, I'll just go through it very quickly. So here he is. Uh, a really smart, lovely little animal. Um, the, the, main, um, the main feature, diagnostic feature, is of course the ringtail, and it's doing a nice job there of hanging onto a branch. So it's a narrow, white tipped tail. Um, it um, is distinguishable from the brush tail possum. The main thing is it does, doesn't have this big, bushy brush tail. But um, the brush tail possum is just a bit bigger. Um, it's also got these much bigger ears. I don't know if you can see much of that head, but you just think that that sort of snuggle pot and cuddle pie sort of possum with the little little peaky face and the huge ears. That's that's a brush tail possum. Um, also, the coloration that tends to be a bit more silver grey, and and the and the ring tail possum tends to be a little bit more sort of uh, browny coloured. Um, and the ringtail possums are a bit smaller. They also build the drays, you know, the, the stick the stick balls, the nest, which they, you know, whereas brush tail possums don't 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 do that. But ringtail possums will also get into the um, uh, into nest hollows or get get into roofs. Roofs. Uh, we we get a lot of complaints from people about ringtail possums in roofs. Um, uh, they're not rats. They're ringtail possums. Uh, and interestingly. Particularly with climate change, ringtail possums will get down onto the ground. So along all the dunes here, you've got the, the spinifex grass, the lamandra grasses, and you've got rabbits um, building their burrows in amongst them. And that's actually a climate refuge for ringtail possums. So on those really hot, dry summer days where you get sort of, well, you don't get 40 degrees here that much, but around Perth we get... Um, will get um, you know, for, for three, three days above 40 degrees. So in those sorts of temperatures, possums can die. And, and there was a, a case in Queensland where a whole lot of, I'm not sure they're ringtails, but they might have been ringtails. They, they just died over this hot summer period. The whole population pretty much died. And, and you know, we are, I mean, we're, animals have a, um, have a window, a, a, a physiological window like us that they can live in and but there's a point where if they if that phys, if, if the temperature goes above that physiological window they die it's like Carnaby's cockatoo 150 of them dropped out of the sky and died around Hopetown because they just it just got too hot for them you know and so they're sitting in the trees and we'll go to the supermarket and get an ice cream and you know walk around and decide what to buy you know and what we're really doing is we're trying to find a place where we can live we we don't realize that but we, we if, if we stayed out in the car park we'd be dead you know so um whereas animals don't have that option so so i found that very interesting that they'll get down onto the ground and get into the tuss of grasses and even even get into rabbit burrows to just escape the heat so so that's one thing you can do for ringtails is you can plant that low dense um, vegetation, tussocky grass, 
you know, we, we, we build refuges for Quenda where we get PVC pipe and we put it, push it into the ground and they will use that, they will go into that. Um, um, we do the same thing for Western Swamp tortoises, um, so they'll go in there and over the hot summer months they'll go in underground, so they'll get in through these PVC pipe tunnels. You do have to be a little, care a little bit careful. We um, constructed some of these um, tunnels for Quenda around Challenger Beach because they were, the numbers were going up and then the foxes would get them and, the, and they would be eaten out of, the, out of the sand dunes and so Alcoa said we've got to do something about this so they funded a bit of research and the local group built these, um, these refuges out of terracotta pipes and the Quenda loved them so they went straight in there and they even had babies in there and it was just wonderful um, but then the foxes you know they just, they just said ah I, if I sit here I just have to wait for the quenda to come out and so we so we basically created feeding stations for foxes so so you've got to you've got to also bait or trap or something so it's, it's you know there's complications there but nevertheless um, just that idea of managing the ground for ringtail possums is an interesting one for the survival of the animals other things people do is um, they'll put water out and again, we tend to think you put water out for birds, but no, you can also put them out for ringtail possums. Ringtail possums need water. Um, and one of the reasons they're declining, particularly in their Jarrah forest populations, is because uh, a lot of the smaller streams and watering points are drying out. So, um, Paul Brown, he used to be a regional manager for Parks and Wildlife, moved across to the Department of Water, but he's not working with the Department of Water anymore, so I can say this. Um, but under the Rights in Water Irrigation Act, the Department of Water has a responsibility to protect community values. And it's not acceptable to just allow waterways, natural waterways to just dry out. Um, uh, but it will happen unless community make a noise about it. And one of the things that happens is you lose your cockatoos and you lose your ringtails because they haven't got places to drink in the long hot summer months. So. Um, Water is a big thing for ringtails as well as um, things like cockatoos. Uh, they are highly arboreal. They, they like to be up in trees. They're nocturnal. As long as they can stay off the ground, ringtail possums are all right. Uh, when they're vulnerable is when they have to get down onto the ground. So, um, so dogs like that eat them as soon as they get on the ground. Cats will eat them. Um, cars will run them over. And so people have come up with innovative solutions as well as planting more trees. They've um, cooperated with their neighbours and they've put um, heavy ropes between the trees and the ringtails are just fantastic. They love it. They'll do anything to stay off the ground, but they need to get around. To, they're, they're looking for their leaf eaters. They're looking for new green shoots. They love, um, they love it when the rains start coming this time of the year, when the, the vegetation gets going again and the new shoots come up. Um, mostly, um, Okay, they build drays, hollows, roof spaces. They have a small home range, about five hectares. Um, and their diet, well, I say almost exclusively peppermints, the Agonis, uh, Mary and Jarrah. But as you probably know, in your garden, they'll, get a, they'll, have, a, a, they'll have a go at anything, grapevines, fruit trees, um, anything that sort of, roses, yep, yeah. So, so I've, I've, my father-in-law, uh, who lives just over the road, that's where I'm staying, He's, there's two, there's two, uh, my understanding is around the Bustleton, Dunsborough area, half the population love ringtail possums, half of them hate <laughs> ringtail possums. My father-in-law's a hater, he goes, you're not down here talking about those bloody possums again, are you? <laughs> so, um, I have special friends and there are two P words that you never need. Yeah. Possums and possums. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'll come back and say, oh, I saw a ringtail possum squash on the ground down, and he'll say, good. <laughs> But anyway, if you've got good neighbours, you, uh, you can put these um, ropes between trees so that possums can travel between uh, backyards without getting down onto the grounds. They try and stay on top of the fences, but you know, they've got to be pretty high fences because the dogs will jump up and get them. Um, so, Nicole spoke a little bit about this, but yes, critically endangered species. Um, so the way that works is um, there's the IU, international IUCN um, criteria. Basically, if a population of an animal has declined by a lot, like 70 or 80% over 10 years, 
or if um, or, or three generations. So ringtail possums, let's say they live for about five years, so over 15 years, if the population has declined by about 80, 70 or 80 percent, then it becomes listed as um, you know initially threatened, but then if it keeps declining, it'll go to critical. So, so the ringtail possum has gone to critical. Um, and where, what happens once a species gets listed under the state legislation, it'll also immediately get listed under the federal legislation. So it's a listed, listed as critically endangered, so a species we've got to do something about. Um, what will normally happen is a recovery team is formed to try and come up with recovery actions to re improve the species. And the recovery team has um, landowners, parks and wildlife. Parks and wildlife normally host the recovery teams. Um, and share them, but it's got universities, it's got NGOs like um, um, WWF and, um, and so on. Um, and the recovery team, they do a recovery plan and in that recovery plan it estimated there was about 8,000 animals left. Um, so what, um, what, what the recovery team has identified is the little dots are where the species has been recorded recently. It did at one stage extend all the way to the south of Geraldton, but you know, it's, that's the range, the wetter, the wetter rainfall areas. And it's, and it's divided the distribution into three management zones. There's the, um, you know, the south coast around Albany, one management zone, the Jarrah Forest, southern Jarrah Forest management zone, and then the Swan Coastal Plain, the, uh, the, blue, the blue area there. And basically they have different, they feed on different things. Uh, they're feeding on peppermints and banksias and tuits on the Swan Coastal Plain here and, and certainly around Albany. But in the Jarrah Forest there's not much peppermint so they're feeding on um, you know, Jarrahs and, 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 and a little bit of peppermint along the waterways. Um, and the, you'll notice there's, a, there's a, this small population, this northern population here of ringtail possums around Lake Clifton or the Peel Harvey catchment area. Um, so that's very interesting because um, when one of the reasons I, I, I got concerned about the ringtail possum when, it, when its numbers declined in Yalgrup, um, you know, we're all, Parks of My Life is always looking for ways to be more efficient and we haven't got much we don't have, uh, yeah, we're always looking at ways to sort of do things more efficiently and, and people started to say um, well don't worry about this northern population because they're probably translocated animals, they probably were never there naturally so they've just been translocated there from, um, from down south, um, they're, they're blinking out anyway, you know, you're better off to sort of just put your resources down south where the main, around this area within the where, where the stronghold of the population is and you know it's always a real concern when you start talking about not maintaining species range so if you let this population blink out here suddenly you've you know where, where does it end and so uh, there are a couple of really active um, committed friends and, and community but once again community who said no way no way if you you know if you turn your back on the ringtail possums up here you're going, we're going to make a lot of noise and I won't say one lady's name, but uh, <laughs> boy, I'll tell you what, I, <laughs> I've managed to keep her on side, but I, only just. Um, but you know, good on her. And so we thought, no, and, and she, she dug around and found a whole lot of evidence from early diaries and, and people who used to eat possums, you know, and they, and they said, look, they've always been here and they're definitely a, a resident population. So, so I spoke with, um, luckily at the same time where Ramby Landcare said look we're interested in uh, getting, getting involved so they now have built up a, a, a contingent of about 15 committed volunteers who do surveys around there and, um, and that's great so now we're finding they're actually surviving quite well in the urban areas and, um, and uh, we're monitoring them and you know, it's like anything if you, if you don't you know, count something, measure it, you know, name it, count it and measure it it doesn't exist, you know. Um, I think some of the ancient philosophers used to say that if you don't name it, it's just not there. Um, and you know, the Carnabies is a classic example of that. Um, eight years ago, developers were told, um, well, if you're clearing Banksia woodland, make sure you minimise your impacts on Carnabies cockatoo. So they would clear the Banksia woodland and say, yes, we minimised our impacts on Carnabies cockatoo. And there's no legal way you can. Um, 
say that they didn't minimise their impact, you know, they, they minimised their impact. But nevertheless, the, it, it was basically just a box ticking exercise. But after BirdLife uh, set up the Great Cocky Count, and now we have um, 700, 800 counters every year counting um, Carnaby's cockatoos. And, and once you start counting those numbers and looking at trends, um, um, well, particularly the Commonwealth Government got very interested in it. And so now, well, you know, we've acquired almost 30,000 hectares into the conservation estate through, through the Carnaby's um, offset process. Um, over about almost 20, 25, 24 million dollars has been generated for acquiring that land and doing restoration activities. None of which would have happened without community science and community input. Um, and the same sort of thing's happening with ringtail possums now. They're definitely on the radar now. We've got, we've got over a thousand records now from you guys. Um, just saying, this is where we saw ringtail possum. This is the location and this is the date. This is um, how many we saw. You know, these, these ones had babies and so on. And so though all those records have gone into the corporate database, so they're publicly available. And they go into um, when development applications are being considered, it's one of the layers that is put over the, the process to say, okay, where's the ringtail possum habitat? And where, and what, and what habitat is actually <laughs> occupied and being used. Um, okay, so, so that's the process which is now in place because of this. Um, so why are they declining? Well, you know, the obvious one is um, habitat clearing. Um, if I just look at the <coughs> Swan Coastal Plain population or, or management area, they're mostly, mostly in, as I say, Tituit and, um, and Peppermints, but, but also the the Banksia woodlands and about half of the Banksia woodlands have been cleared on the Swan Coastal Plain and around Perth it's more like three quarters and so that fragments the the, the country and so that means that uh, there, there might be the average patch size is much smaller than it was uh, 50 years ago. It used to be hundreds of hectares, 50, the average size was hundreds of hectares, now it's right down to about sort of three or four hectares is, is the average size of this Banksia, Banksia woodland. So, so the problem is the possums need to get around and, but they're smart little critters and um, here's one of these, um, you'll be familiar with them, the, uh, the possum bridges. That one's probably from across the Holy Mile there somewhere. Um, and um, um, Kaiora, the Japanese U University of WA student, was studying these and, and she found that um, Western Wind Hill possums were started using these bridges faster than any other animal in the world has used them. So they, they, they very quickly started using them. As soon as, they, as soon as they built them, the possums started using them because they put little cameras on them. And, um, and what's more, um, they, the possums who, who had a territory either side of the bridge would allow the other possums to travel through their territory to use the bridge, which is kind of really interesting stuff. Um, um, so again, it's a species that's what we say it's trying, you know, give it, give it a chance and it will, and it will, and it will come back and, and it will use, use, use the stuff um, that's offered. Um, so yeah, you know, the, so habitat loss and fragmentation, and then what goes with that usually is just human activity in urban areas. You've got um, uh, vehicles, vehicle strike is a big one. Um, um, if they, they don't do well crossing roads. Um, um, the other day I was here and I was driving under one of these and I saw a dead one underneath and I thought, God, I wonder what happened there. Well, did, it, did it just fall off or did it say, or did it say, oh, I'm not going, oh, don't worry about that thing. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll be right. <laughs> but anyway, that one didn't didn't make it. But um, um, also just competition for hollows. So the hollows are, you know, the hollow trees are being cleared um, for road widening ac activities, and and they're also being knocked out by wildfires. You know, big, big hot fires. That's something we try and minimise. So I mean, our challenge as a department is um, the bush needs fire generally. Um, but what we want is we want cool burns and we want fine scale mosaics. So, you know, we want frequent cool burns and we want fine scale mosaics. We don't, and if we don't do that, the fuel loads build up, particularly with a drying climate, and you get massive wildfires. And those massive wildfires burn really hot. They burn right through the seed bank, all of the, they burn right through all your wetland um, um, organic 
based peat wetlands and, and everything and they burn all your big old trees so so that's what we want to avoid um, um, and yeah and so you know that's what we need to, that's what we that's what we're trying to introduce and we're, we're, we're doing a fair bit of that and, and making some some good good changes in that space I think um, um, they're also competing with things like honeybees you know honey no, native uh, the feral bees are taking over the hollows and that'll drive the possums out of the hollows um, um, corellas um, so yeah fire as I mentioned you know we've got to we're trying to do a better job with that um, so Nicole's been over this a little bit but I'll just talk it through most of you have actually done the ring tile tally but um, the whole idea of it is to set um, establish a set of ur urban monitoring sites where the possums are counted annually so that's the aim like um, what, what are the numbers doing and whereabouts are they um, and you, so you choose your survey site usually your garden most most surveys that live just over half surveys are in people's garden uh, count the number of ringtails in your garden and record the date and how long you were looking for the ringtails. So, you know, it's pretty simple. You just say, okay, I was looking for half an hour. I saw this many ringtails. This is where I live. And this is the date when I, I did that. Um, so very simple sort of um, science. You're recording the maximum number of ringtails you've seen within the search area and um, avoiding counting the same individual twice. Uh, suggest you try uh, as Nicole said if you can do more than one survey that's great we suggest two surveys per week so it's a, a one month survey period and if you do su two surveys for, for week, we're, per week we're talking about eight surveys that's ideal but even if you do one survey it's, it's better than nothing uh, let us know what the street address is the date and the time and um, if you don't see any rigtails please send that information in because those zero counts are important for the in that, in that, two, in that two week period yeah so if you do two evenings a week over four weeks, yep. and you see a possum every night, but you don't want to know about the same possum every night, yeah, or do you want yeah, to say yeah. no, we do. Every night, yeah, every night, good every question. Night. Yeah, yeah, we do. We want to know. So think of think of each of your evening surveys as being a, a completely separate observation. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so it's not related to the other observations. It's just. Uh, and so if you see one person, and if it's the same possum you see it every night, then you just put a one, a one, a one. And if you do eight surveys, you've got eight surveys with, with one possum seen. Thanks for asking that question, but that's, that's, that's really important. Yeah. What about the hides? Yeah, yeah, well, please let us know if you see hides. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, and things like scats, uh, the, the droppings, you know, they're, they're quite distinct if you, if you see them. Um, yes, definitely. Anything like that. And um, yeah, just whizzing through this, so that's the form. So we, we want to know, you know, your name and your address, street address. Uh, you describe, you tick a box. Uh, most are in urban, suburban gardens, but you might be a semi-rural house block or a, or a sports park or a bushland patch. So you just tick the box. And then, um, as I was saying, so you're writing the date. How long you spent surveying? 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, that's pretty typical. The average survey is about 30, 30 minutes. Um, and you know, one, zero, C zero, that's good. And in this case, the person said, I've seen four different animals. Okay, I hope they understand what's, what's being asked here. Perhaps not. We don't put too much weight on this, this figure. So these are the main figures we're interested in. But what that means is that that animal was different to these two, and they were different from each other, obviously. And this animal was different from all of those. So there were four different animals over those four surveys, according to, to that figure. More commonly, what will happen is they'll say there were just two different animals, okay, because that was the same animal on those other nights, you know. But don't fret about that, this figure. We don't put too much weight. The main figures, the main, the main information we get is from these surveys and those numbers, okay. And then there's all, also the additional information down the bottom like um, um, time spent surveying, <laughs> um, just information on, on breeding. Do you see any babies, any youngs, any deaths? Um, uh, what were they feeding on? So you can just sort of fill that information out. If, one, if you don't want to fill that information out, that's fine. It's, um, it's just additional. So we've got some results um, so from the seven surveys. So 
54% of the surveys are in just suburban gardens, 22% uh, in semi-rural house blocks, 10% in sports park, uh, in parks and sports fields, and then 14% in bushland. So, you know, it's very much a peri-urban survey. Um, and, you know, this is, this is what's nice to see. So our survey efforts just increasing every year. We've got 60 observers now and roughly 60 sites. So that's a good number. That's across all of the, the southwest, but it's, but it's getting there. And over a thousand sightings of possums now. So that's really good data. Um, and, you know, citizen science, that's 180, 81 survey hours. Um, you know, we can't do that, the department can't do that. Um, whereas you guys, you know, all working across the thing, it all adds up to a really significant survey effort. Um, um, half of all feeding observations are on peppermints. They, they love peppermints. Uh, causes of death, 79% were road kills. But just bear in mind that um, a road kill is easy to find, you know. It's there and you can find it. Um, we, who knows how many are just eaten so but of, of the deaths that can be identified most of them are road kills um, and cats and dogs it's about 10 percent um, yeah the cat and dog may not be immediate. yeah that's right yeah exactly yeah yeah that's right yeah yeah um, so over the years um, we've got the blue column is number of sites where surveys were done and the green column is the number of observers so not surprisingly you've pretty much got one observer per site so it's a one-to-one -one. but we're starting in autumn 2016 here and then to autumn 2017 and then we did a spring survey in 2017 we just had fewer observers only about 19 observers so it's just just starting it there um, and then 18 19 and we did a spring survey in um, in 20 as well so so you can see we're averaging you know we're, we're gradually going from 40 observers up to 60 observers so it's gradually increasing yeah, so yeah. when you said the total number of observers was 65 was that just last year what's yeah. the total over the uh, oh good question yeah um, yeah in other words how many are, are dropping yeah. out and coming yeah. in yeah um, Usually, if for the citizen science surveys, often it's quite high. So you might have a hundred surveys in in year seven, yeah. but over those seven years, if you count all the different surveys up, it's more like you know twelve hundred so so people. But with this ringtail possum count, I think most people who have started the survey are continuing the survey. I would guess that there's probably about eighty or so um, observers across the whole time. But I haven't actually looked at that. I could I could easily look at it, but I. I haven't actually looked at that. Um, so this is this is the main graph that we're interested in, which is the average number of ring tails per evening survey per hour. And that's why it's really important that we ask you to estimate how much time you spend looking, because we can we can just scale the number of ring tails seen to survey effort, which is the amount of time spent looking, you know, within that evening survey. And um, so I mean it's not a very exciting ga graph but what's good to see is that it's not it's not doing this it's not starting high and just trending downwards it's sort of um, it's basically staying stable um, and although you know we're saying that you, we're saying okay you, we're seeing an average of say five to six ringtail possums per hour that's just saying what that's saying is if people see two to three possums on average in their half hour survey or in their 20 minute survey we're then saying oh well if they look for an hour we double that well obviously that doesn't happen that so that's statistics so i wouldn't worry too much about the fact that it's saying there's an average of six ring tail possums the main thing we're saying here is that the number of possums per survey effort is about the same or you know it's staying stable um, so that's just good news i mean that's that's good. It just means that the possum isn't the possum numbers aren't dropping like Carnaby's cockatoo. They're just gradually going down as they clear the pine forest, you know, and we can record that. Um, but but the ringtail possum is staying stable. Now that's something I should have. I'm going to go back because I, I meant to mention this to you, and I should have. Um, um, I remember I said that the recovery plan estimated there are about 8,000 ringtail possums. Okay, over that whole area. Well. 
Just recently, Main Roads did a, a survey all the way throughout the range, okay, W Main Roads. It was not part of an offset agreement that, okay, if you want to clear some, widen your roads, if you want to widen your roads and knock over ringtail possum trees and ringtail possum habitats, you've got to put some money into research. So, and so they did, and they did a really good job. They got good statisticians and they got a good consultancy to drive along roads, do the spotlighting, count the possums, estimate the distance to the possums, and, um, and they got a good statistician to help work out the, the, the possum densities using this, these distance sampling techniques. And I mentioned the three uh, management zones, and, and they came up with the population estimates, and they're reasonably robust for each of those three management zones. They estimated that in the Swan Coastal Plain, so this is the blue one, all the way around there, over that whole area, they worked out the de average density of possums by doing transects all through there, like hundreds of transects. And for each transect, they, they estimate the density of possums, so how many possums per hectare. And they say there are, they calculated that there are 9,270 possums in the blue area, right? And it's a pretty robust, it's a pretty ro robust um, survey. They also, in the Southern Forest Management Zone, so that's the orange one there, they estimated that there are seven and a half thousand possums in there. And in the South Coast Management Zone, 3,340. So they suggest that there are over 20,000 Western, Western ringtail possums. Now that's not an increase from 8,000. The numbers aren't increasing. We're not seeing over, this, over the seven years, five years that we've been doing the possum surveys, we're not showing the possum densities are increasing. So what, what that means is that they're, they're just doing a more thorough survey. You know, and they're doing a good survey and it's a comprehensive survey. They're covering the whole area and they're using good statistical techniques. So, I mean, that's good news. It means that um, the, the possum won't be delisted because it's not an increase in population, but it's just saying there are more possums out there than we thought. And I would suspect that the, the true figure is something closer to, I don't know, 15 to 20,000 than 8,000. Pardon? Oh, just done recently. Um, the reference is, uh, it's, yeah, it's Teal and Potts 2020. Yeah, so I can send that report through to you, Nicole, if you want. But. So why do we still say 8,000? Oh, because this has only just been completed right. and I think people are a bit stunned by it, to be honest, yeah. and so it's kind of sitting on a shelf somewhere. But I was involved with, <laughs> don't tell anyone. <laughs> you, you just don't want to overplay that hand, you know, like it's, it's always good to try and, try and get the science in there. And as I say, it's not, it's, 20,000 is still, I mean, imagine if there were 20,000 humans in the world, you know, we'd be freaking out, wouldn't we? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a serious population crisis um, for them. Um, and, and their population has still declined, um, given all the monitoring we've done. So it's declined. So what it means is that it was probably, instead of dropping from 25,000 to 8,000, it's actually dropped from 80,000 to 20,000. So we're, we're still looking at a, a, a decline. So it's still listed as critical. Um, yeah. Oh, very much so, exactly. Good point, yeah, because when they assess it, they say, is the threat still present and ongoing? And, it, and it, well, yes, it's there. It's, it's yeah, actually increasing. It, yeah, and, and you know, we've started to do, do some, or BirdLife has started to do some distance sampling work with black cockatoos. And same thing, you know, the numbers are probably going to be higher than we thought. Um, not, not, you know, not hugely higher, but they say there might be 20, at the moment, the recovery plan says there might be 40,000 carnabies left, there might be 15,000 red tails left, but I suspect you could almost double those numbers, but they're still, critic they're still in danger. Um, but so anyway, that's, I, I thought that was encouraging. Uh, the, as I say, these, these possums, they are, they are trying, and I think they are worth, it is worth the effort to monitor them and try and save them. Um, and keep doing this sort of stuff, you know, if that, as I say, if that line was going like that, you know, 
that would be a real worry and we'd be thinking oh you know what are we going to do but it's it's not so that's the good news so just finally um so these it's a it's a horrible thing to look at at this hour of night so um i'll just i'll just talk you through it these are just locations and you might and you, you might see yourself there somewhere but what i've done is i've highlighted the ones that are sort of geocatch locations so i've got geograph quindala bustleton dunsborough west bustleton and so the lighter these lines are the um uh identifying the geocatch sites um and what, what I've got is number of observers, and I've ranked it so that this, um, no, I haven't ranked it on observers, but this is the number of observers or number of sites. So some sites have got six, six observers, 44 observers or 44 sites, 17 sites right down to just one or two sites down here. Statistically, if you want to say anything about a location, you want to have a good number of sites and observers, you know, no less than six or seven or so. So we really can't say too much about these sites down here at this stage, but uh, what we can do is just sort of drum up, drum up enthusiasm, see if we can get these numbers up a bit down here. And then we've, I've ranked it by, no, I haven't even ranked it by a number of evening surveys. So there's the number of surveys. Some sites of some areas like um, 400 surveys in Bustleton. Hey, well done, that's great. So that's 481 surveys, that's fantastic. So that's starting to give really good statistical, robust information. So we can say a lot more about the trends in the Bustleton area than we can say about the trends in, in some of these areas down here. Um, and here we have um, the average number of ring tiles seen per survey. Okay, so, so you can see that, um, I mean, we've got um, Bouvard here with sort of six per survey, but there's only six um, observers and so you just have to get a couple of really enthusiastic people in really good ring tile hotspots to push that average up a bit but but if we're but we're talking about an average um, for you know Bustleton Dunsborough of two to three possums per evening which is really good you know it's uh, that's pretty good um, yeah so that's just gives you a bit of context of where you where you sit in as far as possum numbers go, possums per survey generally up towards the top where there's good numbers of possums. Yeah, yeah. it's useful to sort of pick a site that might be close but you know it's unlikely to see a um, so Oh yeah. It's, uh, to be honest, no, no, it's a good question. Um, I. I think at this stage where we're just trying to, our main objective at the moment is to get information on, on, on the trends in numbers. Like what are the numbers, how are the numbers trending through time? That's kind of the main objective. And that being the case, I would be encouraging people to try and do surveys where they know possums are. Um, and often citizen science surveys, whether it's Quenda, whether it's Cockatoos, whether it's Rakali, the water rats, they tend to be biased, or even bird surveys, they tend to be biased towards the places where there's good birds, good numbers, good diversity of birds. And that's just inherent in, the, in that kind of way of collecting data. And I think it's okay as long as you're aware of it and manage it. I mean, I've no, no doubt that um, all of these sites and all of these numbers are skewed towards sites where people think there are ringtail possums because people will say, oh, I've got ringtail possums in my backyard, I'll, I'll do the ringtail possum survey. People who don't have ringtail possums in their backyards, they're, they're not going to do the survey. Um, so it's bi we, we know there's a bias in that direction anyway, so you might as well just go with that bias. And um, so what we wouldn't do, for example, is we wouldn't take this an estimate of possum densities from this data and extrapolate across the whole of the um, Bustleton area or the Geocatch area because, because that would hugely overestimate the number of possums that are here. Um, the main road survey, they randomly placed their transects. So they didn't know whether possums were there or not, they just randomly placed them along the roads. And so they can extrapolate to the whole of the area as long as you randomly place it. So they got a lot of zero. They got a lot of zeros. Um, yep. Um, yes, and you've kind of seen this, but survey, that's, the, when, that's when the survey starts on 10th of April. So please uh, do it again if you can. That would be wonderful. Um, two, e two evenings per week is ideal. Start 30 minutes before sunset. Um, you can go, you know, 
as late as 10 p.m. if you want to. Um, return the surveys to Nicole by uh, 31st of May. Um, oh, don't send them to Warambi Land Care. That's, um, don't send them there, send them to um, Geocatch. I give a lot of these talks. Um, yeah, okay, so there it is. Happy to answer any questions.